Well, hi everyone. My name's Steve Layson. I'm part of the ministry team here at Jeringong Anglican Church, and I'd like to welcome you to our online prayer book service today. A little bit later, we'll be following um, the service order you'll find on page 39 of the Green Australian Prayer Book. So if you've got one of those at home, you might like to get and have it handy. Uh, we've met together today to thank God uh, for our salvation, which comes through His Son, and the hope of eternal life that we have in Him. We can praise him both in word and song as we pray and sing together. We're going to hear from God's word how Moses and the Israelite community responded to God's rescue. And we're going to pray for our world, for our community, our church and for ourselves. But to begin our service, let's hear from the word of God. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus calls for us to come and to get our sustenance and our strength from him. But so often we, f- we look to the things of this world, don't we, uh, to, to give us hope and meaning uh, and to give us satisfaction. So let us begin our service by confessing our sins to Almighty God. We're on page 39 of the prayer books. Merciful God, we humbly admit that we need your help. We confess that we have wandered from your way. We have done wrong, and we have failed to do what is right. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us. Wipe out our sins and teach us to forgive others. Bring forth in us the fruit of the Spirit, that we may live as disciples of Christ. This we ask in the name of Jesus our Saviour. Amen. God wills that all people should be saved. In response to his call, we acknowledge our sins. He pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. Therefore, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, to whom be blessing and honour forever. Amen. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. Let us begin our service by giving praise to God as we sing that wonderful old hymn, Praise the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Our first reading this morning comes from Exodus chapter 15, starting at verse 1 and reading through to verse 21. The Song of Moses. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. 
The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, by the waters piled up. The surging waters stood firm like a wall. The deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils. I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword and my hand will destroy them. But you blew with your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall upon them. By the power of your arm, they will be as still as a stone until your people pass by, O Lord, until the people you bought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, your hands established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them, but the Israelites walked through the sea on dry ground. Then Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women followed her with tambourines and dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, the horse and its rider, he has hurled into the sea. This is the word of the law. The Gospel of Luke, commencing at chapter 1, in chapter 1, commencing at the 46th verse. And Mary said, My soul praises the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered the proud who are... He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Well, thank you, Laurel and Cecily. Uh, And in a moment, we're going to think a little bit further about those passages, particularly focusing on Exodus chapter 15. Uh, But before we do, let's encourage each other with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I really love music. Uh, from pop music to rock music, um, to classical, blues, um, jazz, even uh, sometimes uh, country music. There's something about it, it's such a great gift from God, don't you think? It has the power to move your emotions in a way that nothing else really does. That's why I guess across the centuries people have expressed their love and their joy as well as their anger and their despair through music. It's why advertisers um, use jingles to get us to buy their products. It's why movies and TV shows have soundtracks. They choose music that will enhance what's on the screen and, and help to take you where they want you to go. Um, you know, it's like you, you, see, you hear the crescendo of strings building up the tension as a character moves towards danger or a joyful, lilting kind of song as someone, as we see two people in love or maybe a, a gentle dirge as we, as we watch someone um, dying. And of course, music plays a huge part in church, doesn't it? I wonder if you ever thought why, wondered why. I mean, after all, um, in Australia, it's, it's a very strange thing to do for people to get together and sing. There's very few other places in our culture where people actually get together and sing. So, so why do Christians, well, when they're allowed to, uh, why, why, why do we or why did we when we, when, uh, we were able to meet together? We're going to be thinking a little bit about that um, a little bit later on as we look at the first song recorded in the whole Bible in Exodus chapter 15. Um, I hope as we do that, that we'll be inspired ourselves to break into song. But before we do that, uh, we really need to understand what's been going on and why this song is here. You'll remember that the story started uh, a few weeks back uh, with the descendants of Abraham being mistreated in Egypt. Um, God sends Pharaoh to demand that he let his people go, but Pharaoh stubbornly refuses. So God sends ten plagues to get Pharaoh's attention, if you like, but more really to show him who is the boss. Finally, Pharaoh is broken and defeated, and he gives the Hebrews the green light to leave. In chapters 13 and 14, we see the Israelites leave Egypt um, on the way to the Promised Land. But they don't go alone, for it's very clear that God is with them. You can tell because during the day there's this huge uh, column of, of cloud um, and then at night it turns into a great pillar of fire. There was no mistaking it, God was going with them. Imagine what that would have felt like. Imagine the joy and the excitement, the relief, because for the first time they had hope for the future. It reminds me a bit of those, those scenes, you may remember them, of people dancing on VE Day. Or a little bit closer to home, um, on the Freedom Day in the UK. Whatever you thought about that particular day, you could certainly tell that people were really happy. <laughs> if only. Wouldn't that be lovely? Anyway, Pharaoh, on the other hand, is not feeling so good. He's been publicly embarrassed um, and, and defeated, not to mention the grief of losing his son and everything else that he and his people have been through. To make matters worse... He wakes up in the morning and realises that now the slaves have gone, there's no one to make his morning coffee. He's obviously one of those people who gets like a bear with a sore head before he's had his coffee in the morning. So again, he changes his mind and decides to chase after the Israelites. He gathers his soldiers and his chariots, says, now we're going to get them, and this time we're not going to be defeated because this time Pharaoh is going to be in his element, at the head of his, uh, of his army, the greatest armed force in the world at the time. They chased after and caught up with the Israelites pretty quickly. At the shore of the sea, they are trapped. When the Israelites look up, they see the soldiers, they see the chariots um, lining the hillside. They're terrified. They cry out to God. And, but it's like the plagues have never happened. It's like they suddenly couldn't see the huge pillar of fire that's in front of them. They turn on Moses they blame him. They say, Moses, why didn't we tell you? Please leave us alone. We're having such a lovely time serving the, Egypt, the Egyptians. And now you've brought us out here to die in the desert. It seems like the end for them. All their hope is gone. They're stuck literally between the devil and the deep blue sea. Back in Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, 
Pharaoh asked the question, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Who is the boss? Who is in charge? It seems that despite all they've seen, Pharaoh, the Egyptians, and even the Israelites hadn't quite worked out the answer to that question. Who is the Lord? Well, one of the the main themes in the book of Exodus is that Yahweh is the Lord. He is the boss. He is the one who is in control of all things. Once again, it looked like the end had come for the Israelites, but this was just part of God's plan to help them and the whole world to understand that he is in control. One last time, God is going to show his power and his might. God tells Moses, stretch out your staff over the sea to divide the waters. Meanwhile, the pillar of cloud, God in the pillar of cloud, moves to behind the Israelites, between them and the Egyptians. And as Pharaoh holds out his staff over the oceans, the waters part and the Israelites are able to walk through on dry ground. Just imagine what that had been like. Water on the side, water up on, piled up on each side of you. It must have been incredible. Well, when they're almost through to the other side, the pillar of cloud lifts and Pharaoh and his armies dive in after them. It's like they've got blinkers on. They, I, I imagine they don't even, didn't even look at the sea. They just look at the Israelites. We're going to go and get them. Um, but sadly for the Egyptians, they, they've clearly only got two-wheel drive chariots because as they, as they get through into the ocean, uh, at, at the bed of the sea, uh, they start to get bogged. They suddenly realise that God is there and God is fighting against them. Let's get away from the Israelites, they say. The Lord is fighting against us. But it's too late. Moses stretches out his staff again and the waters crash back into place, drowning soldier and horse alike. The final victory is won. God has defeated Pharaoh and his gods throughout the plagues and now he even beats Pharaoh at his own game. The leader of the greatest military power is blown away by a blast of God's nostrils. Clearly, he didn't have a mask on. When the Israelites saw this salvation, finally, we're told in chapter 14, verse 31, that they feared God and they put their trust in him and in Moses. Finally, they seem to have got it. And so chapter 15 is Moses' song that he composes in response to what we've just seen in response to God's salvation. It's a song of praise to God. Moses says, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. Down in verse 11, he says, Who among the gods is like Yahweh? Who else is majestic in holiness and awesome in in power, working wonders? There is no one like God. They give God the honour and the glory he deserves, which is where God has been leading them all along. In chapter 14, verse 4, God says, I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And the same thing in 14, verse 17, I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his armies. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Finally, they do realise that. Finally, they do realise who is the Lord. It is God. And finally, God gets the glory he deserves. God has been leading up to this very point where all people will recognise God for who he is. And there are two great reasons to praise God in this, uh, in this great song. Firstly, we pray, Moses praises the God of victory. You see, there's been a great battle going on for, for quite some time. Well, actually, when I say it's a great battle, it's actually a very one-sided battle. Um, that shows how holy and powerful God is. No one, not Pharaoh, nor his magicians, uh, nor the Egyptian gods can stand in his way. No one comes close to him. And so this song is acknowledging that God has become my salvation, says says Moses in verse 2. God has come to the rescue. He's come to their aid like a warrior, literally destroying Pharaoh's army. He's won a great victory. Pharaoh and his army boasted strength, uh, but in reality, they were weak and pitiful before the God of the universe. He brushed them aside as if they were hardly even there. This idea of God the victor is a a consistent theme throughout the scriptures. 
we'll see it as we follow the, uh, the Israelites through into the promised land in the books of Joshua and as they settle in in the book of Judges. Over and over again, God acts to bring victory. In Psalm 2, David writes about those who, um, who would conspire against God. He says, why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up. The rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us throw off their chains and throw off their shackles. But the one enthroned in heaven just laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. No matter how many people take their stand against God, it's just a joke. They have no chance of standing against the Lord of all. All that's, all that's left for them is judgment. You see a similar picture in Isaiah 37 when the king of Assyria is surrounding Jerusalem with his vast army, challenging Hezekiah and ridiculing his God. Overnight, God just puts to death 185,000 of his soldiers, just like that. In the second reading we had today uh, from Luke chapter 1, Mary acknowledges the fact of God's power. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms, she says. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. And also, and right at the very end of the Bible, we see the same thing in, in Revelation chapter 16, verse 14. Evil spirits go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. They get to fight against God on the plains of Armageddon. And what's that battle like? How is it described? Is it a huge cacophony of explosions and gunfire with conflict raging back and forth like the tide? No. The very next verse, uh, we're told, there came a loud voice from the throne saying, it's finished, it's over, it's done with. The battle's been won. There is no battle, there's no contest. All that's left is judgment. Because you see, that is the fate for all those who set themselves up in opposition to God. No superpower, no military or political leader, um, no sharp investor, witty comedian or university professor can stand against God. There will be no debating, no last-ditch heroic salvation by Bruce Willis or Arnie, um, just judgment. God has demonstrated his power and his victory over all things and all people again and again and again. This is something that's really important for us to remember at a time like this. We look around the world and we're concerned by the hardline militant uh, groups taking over Afghanistan, about the spread of a deadly virus, or perhaps even about the overreach of governments wanting to control what we can and can't do. It's hard at times like this to rejoice, uh, as Moses does in this song, or even to follow Paul's advice in 1 Thessalonians 16, when he says, rejoice always, and to give thanks in all circumstances. I mean, how do you sing a song of joy in a time of darkness like this? It's hard to feel like singing it when our world is like it is. Well, it's at times like this that we, like the Israelites, need to be reminded that God is still in control no matter what the situation look like, looks like. Look back at his victories. We can rejoice when he, we see his victory, bringing the Israelites through the Red Sea. But more significantly, we look back at the ultimate victory on the cross. It's through his death and resurrection that Jesus has won the greatest victory over our greatest enemy, over death itself. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54 and onwards, Paul puts it this way. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory throughout, through Jesus Christ our Lord. We don't need to fear death or persecution or sickness or anything else. God has given us victory over them all. And if that's not a cause for celebrating, well, nothing is. But of course, there's one more thing that, that moves Moses to praise God here. God is not just a God of power to be filled, he's all, be feared. He's also a God of love and mercy. And so in verse 13, he says, In your unfailing love, you lead the people you have redeemed. And in verse 17, you will plant them, 
You will bring them in and plant them on the mountains, mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands have established. Just as surely as God has done, as, as done what he's done, just as surely is, he, is that he will do what he's about to do. He is going to bring the Israelites to dwell with him in the promised land, in his sanctuary. Just like God has parted the waters, so too he will part the ways and the crowds of the people that stand between the Israelites and the promised land. The people of Philistia and Moab and Canaan will melt away like the waters. The Lord has shown that he is the true king and his reign will continue among them forever, he says in verse 18. The logic is simple. God has done all this so that we know that we can know that he will do what he has promised. For Moses and Israelites, that was being brought into the promised land. For us, of course, is that we, we know that we will dwell in the house of God forever. Nothing and no one can stop God from fulfilling his promises, from fulfilling his purposes. When you look around you and see pain and struggle, when we, uh, when we, it feels like there's nothing else to rejoice about, like there's no hope, then hold on to this truth. Just as God has done, he will do. Just as God has done, he will do. Just as surely as he has rescued us from the consequences of our sin, so too he will return to take us home to be with him forever. And this, my friends, is something worth singing about. I mean, if people can sing and shout about one group of people who have scored more groups um, than another group of people, both of whom they don't know, uh, if they can sing about that, or if people can sing because the boy or the girl that they like have agreed to marry them, if people can sing because they live in a land that is girt by sea, then surely this is something that we can, that's worth singing about. And that, of course, is why Christians sing when they, when they get together, when they're allowed. Um, they look back at the amazing victory Christ has won upon the cross and they look forward to their sure and certain hope of eternal life uh, that, that, that they, just, they just can't keep it in. As Moses puts it in verse 11, Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? And because God is so majestic, so holy, so awesome and wonderful, we are moved to sing. And if we weren't Anglicans who had been socially conditioned for many years never to show any emotion, we'd be like Miriam, whose joy and excitement moved her to stand up and jump and dance and sing and play. Moses is singing here because he's experienced the salvation and the hope that can only truly come from God. We've experienced that salvation too. In fact, a far greater one. And we have an even greater hope than just a piece of real estate in the Middle East. We have the hope of eternity spent in God's presence. We will rejoice with millions of others from across the globe and throughout the ages. So let us sing praise to God for all that he has done and all that he will do. Let me pray. Dear Lord God, we praise you because you are a God of power. You are the God of all power and majesty and glory. We praise you for your great victories that you have won, that you've shown, demonstrated through, um, through Moses, bringing Moses and the Israelites out of Egypt, from saving them from Pharaoh. But Lord, we've seen it all the way through, right through to Jesus, over and over again. And finally, Jesus dies to set us free. His death and his resurrection defeat death. And because of that great victory, Lord, we also look forward to the great promises that you have made, the fulfilment of those promises. We look forward to the day when each one of us will see you face to face and we will live with you forever in your dwelling place. What a great privilege. What a great joy. Lord God, we want to praise you. We want to sing your praise. We want to rejoice because we are so thankful and so excited at what you have done and what you will do for us. Amen. Well, in a moment, Barbara Brawley from our 10 o'clock service is going to lead us in prayer. But before she does, and as, as we introduce the, the prayer time, we'll be on page 41 of the prayer books and let us pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, teach us to pray. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Be exalted, Lord, above the heavens. Let your glory cover the earth. Keep our nation under your care and guide us in justice and truth. Let your way be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Send out your light and your truth, that we may tell of your saving works. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for we put our trust in you. Hang over to Barbara Bordley, who's going to lead us in prayer. Would you like to join me in prayer? Lord, we thank and praise you that in these difficult and uncertain times we can participate in this service using the internet. Thank you, Lord, that despite being at different locations, we are still one in Christ, and we thank you for our church family. We also know that you're always with us, hearing our prayers, whether we are in lockdown or not. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance of your love, care and provision for us and that, that our location makes no difference to this. And in this time of isolation, Lord, we especially pray for those who are finding it difficult, especially those living alone. Please comfort and strengthen those who are suffering loneliness, fear, mental health issues. Help and guide us, Lord, to reach out to those who need support at this time not only for those in our church family, but our friends and neighbours. Lord, we have witnessed the terrible situation in Afghanistan, the despair and chaos of recent days. We thank you for those who have been airlifted to safety and pray for them as they start a new life. We know, Lord, that they will be mourning the loss of their homeland and in many cases their families. Please strengthen and help them on this journey, and may we as Australians welcome and care for them. And Lord, for those who remain in Afghanistan, we pray in your mercy that you will bring peace to this land after decades of conflict. For the women and girls who face an, and an uncertain future, especially Lord, we pray for Christians that you will uphold them and strengthen their trust in you and for your hand of protection on them. Please, Lord, hasten the plans of aid agencies who are seeking to support the local population. And we bring before you, Lord, those who you call to take your gospel overseas. So we especially pray for our own link missionaries, for Simon and Jess in Bari, Andrew and Liz in Phnom Penh. We pray for Simon and Jess as they attend the GBU conference and for the effectiveness of the talks they present. Help them to be wise and bold in their planning for the GBU year ahead and for the effectiveness of the evangelistic outreach of their own church. For Andrew and Liz, please keep them strong physically, emotionally and spiritually Help them as they encourage the members of their church, support those in financial need, and as they seek to be a witness for you. And in our local region, we commend to you the Shoalhaven Aboriginal Community Church in Nara. For Phil Miles as he leads and encourages them, for his weekly newsletter and sermon notes, to provide for the many who do not have access to the internet. And please, Lord, raise up a new pastor for this church. And we thank you, Lord, for those who serve us faithfully here in Jeringong, for Steve and Lorna, John and Fiona, Susan and their families. And we pray for Steve and John for guidance and give them wisdom as they continue to plan for the future and use them to equip us as we seek to live for you in this town. 
And we also commend to you, Lord, the young families of our church, that you will sustain them in this lockdown period amid all the pressures of being at home and doing homeschooling. And also we commend to you, Lord, those who are separated from their families. And so in our own country, we pray for those who lead our governments, both at the federal and state level, for Scott Morrison, Gladys Berejiklian. Please give them and their chief health officers great wisdom as they deal with this COVID outbreak and help them to make good and wise decisions, especially as they consider when we should move out of this lockdown period. So Lord, there are many known to us here in Jeringong who are in need at this time, and we pray for them and those caring for them for a special provision for them from you to sustain them in their time of difficulty. For Greg and Michelle, for Robin and Graham, Stella and Graham, Robert and Shirley, Amy Vink, Grant Wilson, and others who are known to us personally. And so, Lord, we know that you hear and delight in our prayers. Please help each of us to live faithfully and consistently for you in the coming week. Help us not to be anxious in anything, but in every situation, present our request to you, Lord, knowing that you loved us so much that you sacrificed your life on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins so that we may have the promise of eternal life with you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, can I thank you again for joining us for our online service today. It's been great being able to worship with you and uh, to share in God's word together. To finish off our service, will you join with me as we say the grace together? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Let's do as Moses did and as the people of Israel did in response to what God has done through, through his salvation. Uh, let us finish off by worshipping God in the, the words of the wonderful old hymn, O Worship the King. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.